Hello. Welcome to another video in our series on the book of Matthew. Don't forget you can watch all our Matthew sermons here in the special playlist. And don't forget to like and subscribe to be notified about new sermon videos. Now today we're going to be looking at six simple verses. And these verses give us three pictures of faith. So today, why don't you join me as we go to the end of chapter 11 and discover some of the most simple and yet profound truths that Matthew records Jesus saying. The story is told of one of the largest Japanese cosmetic companies. One day they received a complaint that a consumer had bought a soapbox that was empty. Immediately, the firm investigated the problem and realised the problem was on the assembly line, which transported the package box of the soap to the delivery department. For some reason, one soap box went through the assembly line empty. The management asked its engineers to solve the problem. Working quickly, they created an x-ray machine with high-resolution monitors manned by two people to watch all the soap boxes as they passed down the conveyor belt, making sure they weren't empty. They presented their high-tech, high-cost, sophisticated solution to the company, only to discover that an assembly line worker had also proposed a solution. He bought an electric fan, plugged it in, and pointed it at the assembly line. He switched it on, And as each soap box passed the fan, it simply blew away in the empty boxes of the conveyor belt. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Sometimes we make Christianity seem so difficult. We make it complicated. We act as gatekeepers, only wanting to let the brightest and best into the kingdom. We have prophetic maths, we have salvation formulas, we have old English Bibles. And we are guilty sometimes of treating finding God like a school exam. It was the same in Jesus' day. The religious leaders and authorities often acted as if they had a monopoly on faith. You had to know the right things. You had to do the right things in order to find God. But Jesus says God wants everyone to know about him. Jesus says that a lack of education, status or privilege will not stop you from understanding God. Everyone can... In fact, anyone can discover the simple truth of God. In fact, Jesus says the only thing that will stop you discovering the truth about God is your own sense of self-importance. If you think you know it all, if you think you have nothing to learn, if you think you've got the meaning of life all sorted out, well then, watch out. Because your pride might just have stopped you from grasping the simplicity of God's love. Now I need to say something important here. Yes, it's true God wants everyone to know about him and to understand him. And yes, Jesus says that all we need is childlike faith to find him. Jesus is clear that you don't need degrees, qualification, a high IQ in order to understand the truth of God's kingdom. But please... Let's not swing to the other extreme. Don't make ignorance a virtue. Never forget the same God who wants us to come to him with a childlike faith wants us to grow into Christian maturity. Paul reminded his readers in Corinth, do not be children in your thinking. Rather, in your thinking, be adults. So yes, come as a child but grow into an adult. So today, don't worry about being simple or unqualified or not good enough. Don't worry if you feel like a child, because God's grace says, 
Yours is the kingdom of God. You could say Henry VIII was picky about his wives. After divorcing one, beheading another, and then losing uh, another one in childbirth, he was looking for a new wife. Trying to shore up some continental support, he thought he'd find a convenient option in the two sisters of the Duke of Cleves. Unsure of which of these two sisters he should propose to, he sent a painter to paint both of them. As the story goes, Henry preferred the look of Anne. However, when she arrived, she wasn't as attractive to him as, she, as he thought she would be from the painting. It was another of his unhappy and short marriages, but at least she kept her head. And interestingly, there's another story earlier this year about paintings of Henry's wives. It turns out that for over 500 years, we've been getting pictures of his wives mixed up. All things have been handed over to me by my father, and no one knows the son except the father, and no one knows the father except the son, and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Before we laugh at Henry's portrait problems, how many of us know people whose online profile pictures look nothing like them in real life? Or perhaps you've gone to check out a car and you discover the picture of an auto trader looks nothing like the beat up jalopy on the driveway. What does God look like? How does God let humanity know what he is like? How does he let the world know about him and his plan of salvation? Well, he gives us pictures. In the uh, Old Testament, he used the idea of a sanctuary. He used it as an object lesson to show how God would be reconciled with man. It painted a picture of the separation of sin, the cost of forgiveness, and the sacrifice of God that will make it all possible. But that wasn't the only picture that God painted. The Old Testament writers, the poets, the historians, the prophets, well, they wrote about God, his story, and how we can find ourselves in it. And these were pictures of God. But like Henry and the portrait of Anne, we sometimes don't quite see the portrait in the same way that the painter did. These pictures of God were never able to capture every angle or all of his character. So what's better than a picture? Well, real life. The Gospels tell us that Jesus is the complete revelation of God. Jesus is the complete, full and perfect picture, revelation of God. So what is God like? Well, Jesus says, if you want to see the Father, if you want to know the Father, look at me. In fact, he says the only way that the Father is revealed is through his Son, Jesus. So if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. He welcomes the excluded. He heals the hurt, the lost, the broken. He provides and sustains. He is gracious. He is loving. He gives up status, position and power in order to rescue us. And the high price he pays for you and me gives us value, purpose and a future. So look to Jesus and discover a God, gracious and full of steadfast love, a God that keeps his promise, a God that calls you my son, my daughter. So today, don't let badly drawn pictures keep you away from God. Don't let anyone deceive you about the character of God. If in doubt, look to Jesus. And in his face, see the God that loves you and welcomes you home. I read a story about a cyclist. He discovered the joy of riding as a kid, spending hours on the bike away from his difficult home. As he became a teenager, he realised he had a talent for well, suffering on the bike. 
In other words, he could ride harder, longer, further than his peers. He got a coach and very and soon every hour of his day was spent riding, training, eating, sleeping as he tried to make it as a professional. He then spent 15 years as a pro. Each hour of his day, each meal, each ride, each exercise, each hour of sleep was organised in order to make him a more efficient team member. Then he retired, put weight on and let the bike gather dust in the garage. But one day, he got on the bike, left the bike computer, the heart rate monitor at home and he rediscovered the simple joy of turning the pedals in the sun. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Why is it that organised religion seems to swap one burden for another? Why is it that the solution we offer seems to be harder than the difficulties of life? People suffer discouragement, pain, hurt. People look for answers, for hope, for restoration. They come down to us, bow down with the burdens of life in this sin-soiled world, and we give them new, better burdens. We give them standards, we give them rules, we give them expectations. We give them a heavy yoke. If I remember the stories right, my granddad was a plowman. In our world, the tractor driving farmer can plow a straight furrow with the help of sat nav, GPS controlled steering and technology. In a bygone age, the straightness of the lines were determined by a steady hand and a fixed eye. Made all the more difficult because the plough would be drawn by animals. And the wooden beam that went across the animal's necks, joining two together, was called a yoke. So throughout history, the word yoke has been used to describe hardship. It's been used to describe subjugation. It's been used to describe the overpowering and oppressive forces that keep you under control. There's another use for the word yoke. A rabbi's teaching would be described as their yoke. And a yoke could be heavy if the expectations were onerous. If the rabbi's teaching was hard, well, you had a heavy yoke. But Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden light. Why is Jesus' burden light? Well, that's simple. Because unlike our heavy yoke, that's because it's our work, because unlike our attempts to earn our righteousness, our attempts to do it all, our attempts to keep the law, unlike that heavy yoke, when we are yoked or connected, tied together, partnered, with Jesus. In Jesus' yoke, Jesus does the work. We find rest because of God's grace. Jesus does the work. Jesus does the pulling. Jesus keeps us straight. We just have to walk with Jesus. So how can we experience rest in this world? Well, in the next chapter, Jesus will talk about the Sabbath rest and well, we'll look at that next week. But it's really very simple and very easy. Stay connected to Jesus. Let him shoulder your load. Let him carry your burden. Let him lead you. By giving up everything and allowing God's grace to control our lives, we gain rest. So today, whatever you do, do not swap one heavy burden for another. Don't try to earn your righteousness. Don't try to work for your rest. Don't try to save yourself. Let the grace of God connect you to Jesus. 
Let Jesus' yoke and God's good works keep you going in a straight line and enter the rest of the Lord. Six verses, three pictures of faith, three simple messages, three profound truths. The message of God is simple. God loves you. He is for you, not against you. He wants a relationship with you and he will do whatever it costs to make it possible. He wants to give you a new life and he's coming soon to take you home. And we discover these truths about God by looking at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, don't take my word for it. Look at Jesus, read about Jesus, talk to Jesus, live your life with Jesus. Jesus is the full, complete and perfect revelation of God. And don't believe any description of God that doesn't look like Jesus, because Jesus reveals God. Jesus does the work. Jesus' yoke is light. To experience his rest, to have your burdens lifted, stay connected to the Saviour. Allow God's grace to lead you. Allow Jesus' yoke to keep you going in the right direction. And let the grace of God do wonderful things in your life. Find your rest in Jesus and God's grace. Six verses. Three simple pictures of faith, three profound, life-changing truths. Why not believe them today and find rest for your soul in Jesus Christ? May you experience the simple truth of our Heavenly Father's steadfast love and mercy. May the Spirit lead you to the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. May you find your rest in the faithfulness of Jesus. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.